Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Detecting American History. Glad to see everybody here this month. Um, yesterday we had last month's chat, but uh, in the new year, ready to uh, and hopefully have fun doing it. Thanks for everybody on the panel showing up. It's, been, um, it's an honor having you on here finally in the chat since we first started back with Family Campfire and it's uh, John here. Um, everybody tonight is Nathan Dunn, also known as Road Warrior 72 on YouTube. Subscribe to him. He's got quite a bit of subscribers, so you probably already hit him up there. He does some great videos, digs up some amazing finds, and, uh, and uh, won't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, everybody. So, uh, yep, my name is Nathan, obviously, and uh, on YouTube, I am Road Warrior 72 um, Professionally, I am a, uh, I work for Cummins in, uh, Columbus, Indiana. Uh, on the side, I am a gearhead slash metal detecting, you know, metal detectorist. Uh, somewhat slightly socially awkward at times. Um, so I started my YouTube channel, uh, I guess it's been probably seven or eight years ago. And I've been putting up videos on it uh, ever since. And I started metal detecting. Actually, it's kind of a funny story. Um, I'm sure like a lot of people, I fell into a YouTube uh, death spiral one night of various different videos uh, of things, you know, searching through the woods, uh, old abandoned uh, things in the woods and, you know, rivers and streams. And I came across a famous YouTuber uh, known as the Aqua Chigger and saw one of his videos and it was the video where he found all of the uh, silver coins in the river and in the video you can just see them all all over the place and uh, I thought man that is so cool and I started watching you know and at that time he didn't have a whole lot of videos but I watched all of them and then I started watching even more YouTube videos and I uh, I asked my wife, you know, hey, for my birthday, I want to get a metal detector. And so we didn't really know what to get or anything. And so I started out with a Garrett Ace 150. And I probably used it for about a year, I'd say, maybe a little bit more. And then for another, I guess it would have had to have been a year because then another, I think it was a year later, I we went in halfway on my AT Pro. And of course now today I'm swinging the CTX 3030, uh, but I do still have my AT Pro. And between the AT Pro and the 3030, I had an Ace 400. So I guess a little bit about me. Any particular questions or anything? Yeah, I'll, uh, Matt, you want to go ahead and start with questions and we'll, uh, Get him online out and figure out all about him. Absolutely, I'm seeing some questions in the chat, Utah. But uh, we'll stay with with Nathan here right out of the gate. Um, uh, Nathan, I want to know. Obviously, a lot of folks are going to ask you what your your favorite find is and and what kind of hunting you do and things like that. I'm going to go a little different route. I'm just going to ask you a few questions about um, what advice you might have for somebody getting into metal detecting. Uh, you know, having you know, listening to the story that you talked about, getting a uh, an ace to start out with, and getting the AT Pro and things like that. What advice would you have for a beginner getting into metal detecting? I think a lot of it depends on how big into it they want to get. You know, this is my opinion. Are they? Is it going to be just kind of a weekend warrior thing? Is it something that they're really going to get into? Uh, I think for me, it started out as, you know, a weekend warrior. Hey, this guy, he found a whole lot of really cool 
uh, silver coins and a lot of other awesome stuff. And at first it was kind of a weekend warrior thing for me. And then I started actually finding things and was like, oh, I'm going to get into this more heavily. So I think what your intentions are with it, what direction you want to go with it, and when it comes to the machine that you're going to use, what kind of budget you want to, you know, go with. So how much saying, money you want to spend, and and then that's kind of where your your research on metal detectors starts. Right. So figure out your budget and what you want to spend, and how much time you're going to be doing it. You don't need to you don't need to drop five grand right out of the gate just to get into the hobby, right? Right. Okay. I also want to know. I want to ask you about your YouTube name, that Road Warrior seventy two. How'd you come up with that? So, um, obviously, Road Warrior is a Mad Max movie. It was the second one in the the original Mad Max trilogy. Uh, I have always been into that movie series um, ever since I was a little kid. And when I was younger, I don't know, I'd say probably maybe like 12 or 13, somewhere in that area, my brother, my older brother, was kind of big into uh, CB radios and that type of thing. And his CB handle was Road Warrior. But that was the one that I really wanted. So instead of Road Warrior, I did Mad Max as my CB handle. Um, and then just as I grew up, I kind of took over the, the Road Warrior uh, name as kind of like a, a second... Uh, personality and I don't know just kind of a weird thing 72 is the year of my my uh, my my Ford pickup it's a 1972 uh, Ranger XLT F100 I have pictures of it on my Facebook um, I have lots of videos on YouTube some of my older videos of that pickup so it was just kind of a mashing of you know who i am i wasn't and even I, aware that they i wasn't even aware that they made a ranger in 72 was that like the first one that rolled off the lot um no uh so i guess the i would think that so they did that body style of those pickups from 67 to 72 so i would say that the ranger uh, pickup kind of started in that body style. And then the Ranger that we know today is the smaller mid-sized uh, got its beginnings from the Ford Courier, which was in the 70s, and I believe that was – it may have been a, a mashup between – uh, Ford and Mazda, that may have been the first one, but I, I don't think it was Mazda. I think it was someone else that Ford uh, joined up with to make the Courier. And then in, like, 1982, they came out with the first Ford Ranger uh, as kind of like we know it today, and it had a, a little Isuzu uh, diesel four-cylinder engine in it. Yep, I so, remember. I remember those when they came out. I remember that for sure. As a big fan of uh, Mad Max as well, I, I can appreciate the Road Warrior nickname, so I like that. Staying on the YouTube topic, Nathan, yeah. what, uh, what, what are some of the channels that you follow on YouTube? There's a ton of them out there, but, but uh, what are some of the ones that, you know, when, they, when, they're, when a notice pops up, you go and watch their videos right away? Definitely Aqua Chigger. Oh. Um, Nugget Noggin. I think Nugget Noggin was actually one of the first ones that I started following on YouTube. And I may, I think he may have come after Aqua Chigger, but I know that those two came pretty close to each other. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, by my shirt, Stealth Diggers, uh, the Hoover Boys, some of the bigger guys, definitely Tarko Diggin. Uh, that's a good <laughs> channel. Um, Jumping into my, my subscriptions, actually, because I don't entirely know. Um, 
JD's Variety Channel was another one of the ones that I first started watching. Um, one that I just recently started watching is uh, Zach Bird's Adventure Hour. He's got some really good, funny videos. Uh, MD Gear, uh, Gig Master. Let's see, what are some of the other ones? Bird Dog. Um, I know I'm subscribed to uh, Tim's channel, but I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, yeah. And uh, I know there's I know there's others. Yeah, there's a ton of them out there, like I said. But uh, you and I have a lot, some very similar tastes when it comes to YouTube channels. That's for sure. Um, yeah. Utah, I will I will uh, yield to the next. Uh, uh, panel member to ask some further questions. I I'm trying to get my um, um, unmuted there. Are me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. I I just don't I don't see my my face in the video. All I see is my image, so I don't know what's going on there. But can you guys see my face? No, you'd have to scroll up to the top of the screen. There's a little camera that says turn camera on. Yeah, no, technology. Your truck image. Swansea, I'll let you go ahead and go next with questions. Alrighty then. Nathan, just to kind of follow up what, what Matt was talking about, were you watching these YouTube videos on metal detecting before you got your first detector to kind of get the interest out there? Definitely. Yeah, it's, uh, like I said, Aqua Chigger, I was watching his videos for quite a while, as well as Nugget Noggin, and uh, even some of the early, early JD Variety Channel videos. And... I definitely watched them for a while before I actually started uh, detecting on my own. So is that kind of what influenced you with what brands? Because I noticed that a lot of the people you mentioned go along that line of the Garrett. Was that an influence to you? Uh, I, can you say that one more time? I, I said I noticed that a lot of those people that you mentioned that you follow their channels, including Aqua Chigger and Nugget Noggin, they tend to go toward the Garrett line. Is that the reason you started with the Ace 150 and then went to the AT Pro? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah it. I I I was influenced by him. Not going to deny that. Now, how was the transition between the two machines? Between the Ace 150. And the AT Pro, it was, I mean, it wasn't that difficult. The, the AT Pro is definitely a more, little bit more complicated machine from the Ace 150. I definitely liked having the VDI, which was something that I didn't have before. It's kind of nice having the iron audio option as well. Yeah, definitely. Now, how long was it before you started making your own videos from the time that you started detecting? Um, I think I was detecting for quite a while because I didn't start making videos until I had the AT Pro. And I don't have... Uh, so it, it would have been, I think, just a little over a year ago that I actually started making YouTube videos again uh, that were metal detecting related. So probably, it actually, yeah, it would have been in 2015 because one of my early, early videos had uh, me finding my first walking liberty half dollar uh and that was in 2015 because that was the only silver coin i found in 2015 that's a terrible problem to have <laughs> i guess if you're going to find one silver you may as well make it a doozy right 
Right. All right, then I'm going to go to the stereotypical question that Matt allowed me to ask because he didn't ask it. What is the best find you've made? Oh, well. Okay, not your best. What's your favorite find that you made? I, I have a favorite uh, for this year, and it would have to be uh, that silver bracelet that I found. Nice. And uh, I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see it on here or not. I mean, I can see myself, but I don't know if you guys can see it. But it is a hand-hammered uh, silver bracelet. It's not stamped, and it has a lot of Native American marks on it. And even uh, what a lot of people would assume is a swastika which it is, except that it's not uh, swastika as we understand it to be from World War II era history. It's actually uh, called the uh, whirling log symbol. And uh, there's some interesting... I, I, I have a terrible memory, so I can't really remember the whole story, but there's a really cool... Native American story about where the the whirling log symbol came from. So it's this is definitely my favorite find of 2016, um, and I had some other good ones too. My first ever three ring mini ball. Uh, it was. Strangely enough, I found it in the same location or the same general area as where I found that uh, silver bracelet. And not to give too much away because I don't know who's watching or listening, but there's a lot of history in that particular area where I've been going. And it, it, it may or may not date back to the mid-1800s. Very nice. Uh, and that's actually... Uh, my honey hole. So I I have I have done really well there this year. Now back to your swastika symbol in the uh, the Native American. Doesn't that mean well being? Um, it was. I guess it was kind of a symbol of well being, or maybe a symbol of of peace. Uh, the the story that I had read was. I, I thought it was about this um, Indian who ran away from home and he made a raft uh, by putting the two trees together and went spinning down the, the river and that's where the whirling log came from. And then there was like a war between the water gods in the river and the the gods outside of the river, and um, I i don't remember all of this story, but it, it was really cool, and, and uh, so I think it is kind of a symbol of peace. Now, my last question for you, Nathan, is what type of places do you dig? Are you a field digger? Are you a cellar hole digger? Or do you go to private permissions, parks, schools? What's your preference? I really don't have a particular preference, per se. Um, I'll dig anywhere I can. The only thing I haven't done yet is water detecting, be it river or beach. Um, I, I do a lot of parks. For me, there's times when I feel like going and doing a door knock and getting a permission that way. And then there's times when I just, I just want to go dig. And, you know, for those times when I just want to go dig, I'll go hit a local park or some other kind of, of public place. And when I know for sure that I want to find something, I'll usually do a door knock permission or something like that. Nice. All right, Utah. Well, I, I know you want to get into another topic tonight, so I'm going to cut off my questions there and throw the floor over to you. Um, hey, Tim, I'm going to have you ask questions next. Okay. Um, for everybody that don't know, apparently on your phone, you get the chat, but you can't get 
or the external chat. I have from Girls Rock Metal Detecting. She's actually messaged me a, a question that she wants to ask me. Um, if I can get back to it here. Wants to know with on your AT Pro, Nathan, do you set the ground balance down 10 for silver, 10 for gold, or do you just do the regular ground balance and leave it as is? How do you actually do your settings on your AT Pro when you go digging? Yep. So I think she's specifically asking about for silver. Like if you're going for silver, do you change anything? Yeah. So on on when I use my AT Pro, I run it in uh, Pro Mode Zero with no discrimination. Um, I can't remember how I set the iron audio because it's a little weird when I get it into that into that setting. And then I I I crank the sensitivity to it's a uh, two bars from the top. And then when I do my ground balance. I will generally, you know, find a real quiet place uh, to do it, and I'll just do it automatically. Uh, I don't manually set it. I really don't know how to manually set it, so I usually just let the machine do it itself. And then probably every, I don't know, it kind of depends on the ground conditions and where I'm at, but every once in a while I will stop and redo it. <laughs> Yeah, just um, just so you're aware, because like you said you did, you weren't aware of how to manually set it or anything. Um, after you do the regular machine ground balance and you see where it's ground balancing at, for instance, say if it ground balances at 70, you can go in, you can hold the button down, like go in, go into the ground balance mode. button you press that down in the ground balance mode and it'll actually manually change the um, so you can move that up or down from there um, and then of course you just hit the ground balancing mode thing again and it gets out of that and that's what it's set at it changes it from where it where it automatically sets to whenever you ground balance The one thing I don't know is I don't know if it goes from where it's automatically set at down 10 from there or if you have to scroll all the way up to where um, I think you have to scroll actually all the way up to where it's in range, but I'm not 100% sure. Maybe wherever it automatically ground balances that too and just re-ground balance uh, frequently throughout the day as I'm going along and changing terrain and all. Um, Tim, go ahead with your questions, man. Okay, I only got a few. Uh, um, would you prefer? Do you prefer uh, fields or yards more? I don't think I have a preference either way between a, a field or a yard. And I, 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 I would venture to say that, you know, kind of jumping into the, the topic that we're going to talk about tonight on research is if there's more potential in a field than there would be or might be in a house uh, yard, I, I would almost rather like to hit the, the field first. Um, especially after like the, the video, you know, that the Hoover boys put out just yesterday, you right. know, the, the couple of different fields that they went to and those mm -hmm. guys were popping large since left and right. Like it was nobody's business. Right. You know, and, and six of them, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, it, there, there's almost, 
more often than not, more chance of finding older stuff in a field than what you could find in the yard of a house that's still standing. And that's just in my opinion on what I have observed and, you know, what little research I've done over the years. I have to agree with you on that. Um, now, I know everybody's got their white well, which I found mine this year. It was a seated half. Have you uh, found yours yet? And what is it? My white whale? Yeah. Um, you know, I think 20, 2016 was my best year metal detecting uh, period. I, I went from finding almost no uh, silver coins or even, you know, wheat pennies, and, and a lot of that was based on the topic, you know, that we have tonight, to finding a whole lot of stuff. So... Um, before 2016, I had found, you know, Rosie, uh, Merc Dime, had never found any anything else other than the Walking Liberty half dollar. Um, I think I've got a couple of different white whales, though. Uh, I was talking to my, my digging buddy, Derek, the other day, and I had I have two goals that I want to accomplish in 2017. One is a barber quarter. One is a standing liberty quarter. I think those are, are, right. are two that I would really like to find. But my top of the bucket list uh, coin, at least in my, my you know, kind of tunnel vision uh, mind, is probably a Morgan or some type of Real. Awesome. Well, uh, that's about all I have, Utah. Real quick, I saw there was one question out in the chat, Tim, for you, asking if you uh, got that bezel put on a necklace yet. Yes, Jeff. Your, uh, right your seated here. half that you found. Right here, Jeff. <laughs> so, yes, it is, and you're wearing it. Yep. Um, also, Kimmy wanted to touch that uh, she had heard that it gives better depth bringing for silver to take the ground balance down 10, 10 notches or so after you automatically ground balances. It gives better on silver, but it also the from the aluminum, so you do end up digging more aluminum as well. That's what it would seem like it would do when that happens. But um, um, the pretty much hit on my questions. Um, uh, I do have one question for you. Is uh. uh I know I've seen you at the CWPPO dig. You've been doing this for a few years. Are there other going to or bigger digs? What's, uh, if so, I mean, what's the, the funnest one for you? And own or with a buddy or with a group? Or what's your take on that? Yeah, so C CWPPO. 2015, I heard about, I literally, I heard about it the, the weekend that it was going on, and it was just down in Ohio, and I was, you know, kind of upset that I didn't know about it beforehand. I didn't get a go, uh, didn't get a go. Um, so 2016, like I said, has been kind of a different year for me. Um, I, I did get into some of the competition stuff. The first one that I did was the Southern Indiana Treasure Fest, and it's basically one of those deals where, you know, you you pay pay to play, basically, but you, you know, it's like a seated hunt. So, I did pretty good there. Uh, came out. I definitely made my money back in the the silver coins that I found, and then I did. 
another dig. It, um, I can't remember the name of it, but it was down in Ohio. I think the Silver City Treasure Seekers uh, put it on, and I'm having a little bit of a, a, a brain block right now on the, the two brothers that run it, but uh, that was good. And, you know, those competition digs are, are pretty – they're pretty intense, you know, there's a lot of older gentlemen and older ladies that participate in those uh, competition digs, and they're pretty competitive. They move. Uh, you know, they're they're after the same thing you are, and that's the silver and you know, um, whatever 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 other things they had, uh, whether it was coppers or you know whatever. Then I did the CWPPO and. When I think about things like the CWPPO and the different treasure fests that I went to, there's there's a, a camaraderie there between all the people that go. They're they're going there, you know, because they all have a common interest. That common interest is metal detecting, and that common interest is also saving and preserving history, and there's also a, a, a brotherhood, you know, and, and Facebook and YouTube, they're kind of really unique in that you really feel like you know somebody, um, but you don't really know them. So you know them on Facebook and you know them in YouTube, and they seem like, you know, these really cool people. And, and I remember that. I think that was something that I, I told you, Utah, when we were down there, you know, you <laughs> – you feel like you know everybody, but you don't know anyone. I think that was exactly what I said. And so exactly. going to those type of, of, of digs was especially cool for me because all these people that I felt like I knew, but I didn't really know, I was able to actually get to know. And every preconceived notion that I had about all the people was right. You know, all a bunch of really good, uh, honest, genuine people that were there to have a good time, they were there to recover history and preserve history, and they were there to have a good time. It's it, absolutely amazing to me. Um, now, first year that I went to CWPPO, it was um, for me on the some of the perceptions I had of people totally different than how they really were. Um, those, those weeded themselves out. And we, uh, the second year, actually a much better in, um, cause there was a lot less headaches to worry about. Yeah. It, and, and a lot of that is it's majority versus minority. You're going to have the majority of the people are actually there for the reason that the event was set up. And then you have the minority of people who were there for their own intentions, um, you know, or whatever their reasons were. And uh, yeah, usually those people that are not there for the right reasons get weeded out. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, it was, it was great. I, I fully loved meeting everybody. Uh, Everybody that I talk to on Facebook and have been actually getting to meet them is, is um, and it was no different with you, man. I, once I realized who you were, I was blown away. I was like, oh my god, you know, um, there's another mark off of my bucket list because yeah, he has a bucket yeah. list of finds. Mine are that I, I want to talk to and meet in person and dig with and. Right, another right. check off and, my bucket list. So. Yeah, and 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 Utah wasn't going apparently, and I was kind of bummed about that. <laughs> and then I show up, and there's this guy in the in the register line, and I'm like, that looks like Utah, but I didn't want to say anything because you know people I knew that I didn't really know, kind of thing. And then someone said, yeah, yeah. that's Utah over there. And I'm like, yo, you're kidding me. So that guy did show up. You know, it came up. At the last minute, there was uh, 
the best way I can put it is there was a, an angel out there that it wouldn't be the same if I wasn't there and they really wanted me there. So uh, uh, buying me a plane ticket to get, be able to get up there would have been possible. Going until about maybe two weeks beforehand. Out that yes, um, me a ticket and that I was going to be able to go. I told a lot, a lot of people that I wasn't going to be able to make it because I wasn't. I why just keep it on the down low that I'm showing up because I want to surprise the heck out of these people. And uh, yeah, actually, where I mean there was there was a David Perdue in the hotel we were staying at. Um, me and Tim and Tim's daughter start walking down the hallway towards David Perdue and he was. He thought he was seeing ghosts there for a minute. He didn't realize, you know, he, he just totally stopped and his jaw dropped and he's like, Yep. Why are you coming? What the heck? You know, it was just, it was amazing. Um, so, yeah, I had to pull a little trick on people once I found out I was going. Yep. I heard but, everybody was waiting for you to fall down, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they were waiting. I, I think there was a few that were watching from just waiting for that to happen. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of like tonight, you know. I joke around with people on Facebook a lot, like Dave Edinger. Joking around the other day about hair, and he said, you know, at least his isn't receding from his face like mine. So I have the Dave Edinger hair tonight. I said, well, you know, on the chat, I'll show you who has hair. Speaking <laughs> of which, I do have to get rid of because it's back out of me. Yeah, got rid of the hair. It's like mine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Except I shave mine. I, I actually make it that way. Little high. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, it's a lot of fun to jump around, people. If you can't jump around, there's no sense in being there. Um, so, do you prefer going hunting by yourself, or do you prefer going hunting in a group, or with a buddy, or? Well, I've, I've got a guy that I actually go with uh, pretty regularly. Um, and at first, uh, I don't know. So I guess a couple years ago, I, I would have told you I like to go alone because it's kind of my therapy session. And, uh, you know, I don't really want people talking to me or, you know, asking me a bunch of questions or whatever and uh then i i started going with with my buddy derek and actually now i do kind of like going with people because not only do you get to uh have almost like a, a second person there with you uh if you're you know kind of in a Maybe not so nice side of town, but also, you know, when you find something really good, then you're like, ooh, you know, you get to share it with that person uh, in real life instead of, you know, just on YouTube or whatever. Excellent. So oh. I definitely like going, you know, with groups, um, whether it's, you know, one or two or 12 or 50 or 100, however many, you know, people. So now, Nate, don't you also find that if you're having a day where nobody's finding anything and you can make that jokes back and forth about the crap you're digging out of the ground and you've been out here for six hours and just garbage is coming out, it makes it a little <laughs> less depressing. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. And, and kind of add on to that, Swansea, is uh, when y'all are having that type of day where neither of you digging, digging anything good and then boom, you get something good. And uh, I got a perfect example of that. Me and, and, and my buddy, Derek, we were uh, we were hitting a curb strip in front of the school. And we were in a different town uh, than, you know, we were in a, in a different town, uh, probably about an hour away. And uh, we weren't having that much luck. We we'd maybe had one permission, uh, didn't really have a whole whole lot of luck, kind of striking out. Thought, well, let's just hit this curb strip, you know, and then we'll, we'll go from there. And we went up and down the curb strip and, and nothing, you know. Not any, you know, nothing more than clad. And so uh, I get to the point where I was going to turn around. 
and start going back to the the pickup and Derek's like let's just get out of here and I'm like all right let's okay well let me dig this quarter signal first and it turns out to be a beautiful 1917 walking liberty half dollar and I do have it in uh, one of my videos uh, I don't remember which one but yeah he was he was definitely not happy with me <laughs> See, now I would have been digging alone after that because I would have hit you with the shovel, grabbed the half dollar, and I would have been down the block. <laughs> I, think he, I think he was tempted. I think he was tempted. Uh, let's see here. The video is digging 2016 number 22, Wheaties and Silver. And I do have, a, a, as my picture for the video there, I have that half dollar. But, yeah, it was just... It, it was yeah. so that type of thing, you know, when you're with someone else and, and he's done it to me probably more times than I've done it to him where he's found something really cool. And I just, you know, I kept getting crap. There was, there was another time, uh, we went to another town about an hour away in, uh, actually, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, he was getting silver coin after silver coin after silver coin after silver coin. He ended up with nine silver dimes that day, uh, dimes and quarters. And I was so wow. pissed because the only thing that I could find were wheat pennies that day. And finally, like right as the sun yeah. was going down, I finally had this real shallow uh, silver tone. And I was like, oh, this better not be another stupid clad dime. You know, so I dug it. Sure enough, it was a rosy. So you know what I did? I rubbed the hell out of that Rosie. So, yeah. But know, he got nine, I got I went up to, to dig with Tim. What put me off on digging with people is when I go up there with Tim, you know, we'll go out and there's an old historic park in one of the towns that, you know, has been there since the 1700s. So we go out there to hit this park we would get mentally handicapped people coming up and asking us questions. Tim would send them over to me and go, well, he's the expert about it. You can go ask him. So walking from Tim over to me and then next thing you know, I'm there for 30 minutes trying to explain every little detail. Right. Thanks a bunch, Tim. Thanks. No Appreciate it. <laughs> Hey, hey uh, Utah, I don't mean to break in here, uh, but can you uh, try and resend me the link? I think I've fixed my webcam. But the, the link that you sent me before is not working. <laughs> Let me see. Um, I'm getting an error from it. Actually, if you... um. I think if you right click or click anywhere on the picture, right click anywhere on the picture, reload, it'll reload you up in here. But I will send it to you just in case that doesn't work and it boots you out. Yeah, it's telling me forbidden. Oh, uh, okay. Let me see if I can. Yeah, sorry about that. I mean, I want people to be able to see what I look like and, you know, yeah. You know, I mean, Swansea may not like that so much, but uh, let me see if I can send it from this computer. All right, I want to move on to our discussion topic, which is research. Um, I know everybody does their own different research uh, methods and all. Historic aerials, mentions, of course, Google Earth. Um, I love Google Earth, by the way. Amazing tool, the way you can overlay old maps onto it. Personally, there are a few other things that I do. I don't use historic aerials so much, especially in this part of the country in Texas. I didn't have aerial shots of the places before 1950 aerial photos are all going to be from the 50s to modern day and 
yeah, that's all well and good, but that's not old enough for me. I want um, looking at the old topo maps and the old um, from uh, parks, and, and I overlay them onto Google instead of historic aerial. Um, to me, the best research that I could ever do think that anybody could ever do is talking to those in town. I mean, if you go out somewhere and you know some of the people and you, or you even see an old farmer out in his field walking around asking about the history of the area, I know a lot more than anything is written. Um, the year old farmer still has his wits about him exactly where everything was um, I mean, and that's just me. That's how I do it. Um, but you can go to and find out the different history. And how in depth, and how in depth you, you know, how much time you have to put into it. Um, and that's just for my area because my area is almost like a dead zone. I don't have to go back or 1600s or before because in this area for that um, all that was either down south of me or way out east where um, you know it's pretty much a dead zone we had some Indian activity and that was about it um, up until but um, take over on the research aspect and give your insight and some of your secrets while well, I send him this link. I'm sorry, you tell you're cutting in and out. Did you ask me? Yeah, it, go ahead and give some of your insights and uh, your secrets. Some of your secrets are if you if you're willing, and uh, I'll send him this link. Absolutely. Um, you know, when I saw the topic for for tonight, I I started kind of digging deep and writing some things down. Um, research means a lot to me, and in, in my mind, researching the local history for, for where you live is, is very rewarding, and, and not just, not just if, if you go out and find something nice, but um, just doing the local research and learning more about what happened around you 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, just depends on the area that you live in. It's very rewarding in, in and of itself. The research is very rewarding. Um, I, I broke out two different categories here because I think if you're a coin shooter, your research might differ from that of a relic hunter. So I want to talk first about if you're a coin shooter, what are some of the research tools I would use? Well, First of all, your, your target is you're looking for, for some home sites, some old home sites, uh, schoolyards, old churchyards, anywhere where people congregated uh, back in the day. What I, one thing I, I, I search for is, is looking for old picnic groves or swimming holes or places like that that didn't get a lot of attention, but, but they did it back in you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s that's where the coin shooters are going to find some pretty good stuff. Um, I search for old maps. Uh, you can look at the county level, the state level. Um, you can find a lot of, of, of different maps that are available out there. But I've also found it very helpful to, to try and locate uh, these picnic groves and swimming holes and things like that is to search local genealogical websites and you can do keyword searches um, inside old archived newspapers that some of these old um, historic societies and, and things like that post on, on their websites so you can find where find out where Johnson's Grove was and bear in mind you know a hundred years ago they didn't have air conditioning so they they all went down to the to the grove the picnic groves and cooled off in the, in the stream and, and spent a lot of time down there. The, the Picnic Grove was the 1880s version of today's Facebook, right? 
that that's kind of that's kind of how I look at it. Is is that was the way that people socialized back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, was by going to these places like picnic groves and swimming holes and and home sites um, where where they, they again they congregated. Um, for for the relic hunter, I want to throw out a couple of different ideas, and now I I can speak for the Civil War relic hunter, um, but I'll let Brandon speak for the cellar hole relic hunter, colonial relic hunter. Um, obviously, battlegrounds and battle sites and things like that get a lot of attention, and a lot of those areas are off limits to metal detecting. Um, but bear in mind that those troops and, and people that were involved in those conflicts had to spend the night somewhere. They had to camp somewhere nearby. So do your research based on where they may have spent their time on those travel routes, uh, the old plantation sites, things like that. Home sites are 90% uh, <laughs> of the Civil War era buttons I have found have come from home sites. So find those old home sites that were there in the 1860s Obviously, they're, they're probably not there today. Um, and I want to share one information, too, one, one bit of information. I did a, a video about two years ago now. Gosh, it was, it was February, uh, February 28th of 2015 that I uploaded a video on my favorite research websites. And a couple of them are um, pretty much specific to North Carolina, but I think you'll find a lot of valuable information on that video regarding research. Um, the one other thing I want to mention is, is, is to try to connect with your local historians or historical society. Get with someone where they're on your side to try and locate and, and, and recover some of the, the, the research, some of the, the uh, historical uh, relics in your area. Um, when I was in North Carolina, I did a lot of work with the local uh, historical society. There was also a, a gentleman that I worked with at the uh, uh, the, the local. It was, it was called the Cultural and Historic Center. Um, he he was definitely on my side as far as recovering these relics, finding new locations to to detect. Um, you can you can develop a whole network of people when you're doing your research that will help you get locations, get permissions. Um, now, I'm not going to say that 100% of the time you're going to be able to keep those finds. A lot of that um, may, you know, may you may want to donate to the local historical society. It only makes sense to do so. Um, but but bear in mind, it's all about the recovery. It's, it's about getting those relics out of the ground so that they're no longer decaying. So... So I'll leave it with that. Utah, I can hear you chatting in the background. But um, uh, that's pretty much all I had about research. Did anyone have any questions for me? I have a question for you, Matt. Go ahead. So when you're talking about where they have to encamp somewhere, do you guys – exclusively or well not exclusively do you guys also take into consideration river routes because they had to have access to water like what we do up here yeah you know great question and, and this might tie into some of your research too brandon but whenever i encounter a new property if i get permission to detect on a new property i'm looking for high ground near fresh water because that's where the first residents of that area would have located regardless of, of whether or not it's Civil War relics I'm looking for or colonial relics, I'm looking for high water near, or high water, high ground near fresh water, fresh water resource, whether that's a lake, a creek, a stream, uh, a river, a spring, a natural spring, um, anywhere you can find high ground near a fresh water um, source is a great place to start detecting. Now, how about where you live? Do you guys have access in your local libraries to older town maps that may not be online maps? Like up here, we have hand-drawn maps that you can't even take out of the library. Of course, they're 1700, early 1800s that were somebody drew where the old property lines used to be, where the old rivers used to be. Do you guys have access to anything like that? 
That's a great question. It just varies from, from location to location. When, when I was in North Carolina, uh, the University of North Carolina had a lot of things scanned in online. They had overlay maps. They had several different years that you could choose from. It was very interactive and extremely helpful. Georgia, I have not found that to be quite the case. It's, it's been very difficult for me to locate those older maps. I have worked somewhat at the local level uh, in, in locating, and, and again, I'm looking at, at newspapers from the early 1900s that might tell us where those, uh, those picnic groves are and things like that. But, but when it comes to the, the Civil War relic, uh, items. I'm I'm looking at maps that are more on the national level. I'm looking at uh, you know, for instance, I'm I'm obviously working that Sherman's March to the Sea. So I'm looking for maps that mm -hmm. might show where exactly those troops went, where those those campsites might be located, uh, and then looking for permissions from there. I can't tell if Utah is talking or playing an organ. Yeah, Utah's breaking up really bad. He might have to log out and log back in. I can't understand anything he's saying. Yeah, me either. <clears throat> Did I answer your question, Brandon? Is that is that thorough enough for you? Yeah, you did, Matt. I think that it really hits on a good thing too. Is you know the public maps to me, I know is limited access to us. I mean, there's not a lot of maps that would date back to the town or even the state that I live in, for example. Right. Most of the research we have to do has to go in the older books. Like I said, the hand drawn maps, maybe even some. You can get into our local library, and there's people that were around during the revolutionary time that had written journals, even, for example. And that's what brings up, like you said, the swimming holes, the picnic groves. You can get where old man Johnson had this spot on his property where people used to gather and go swimming. You know, it's, it's weird little nuances of information like that. It's so much more useful than, you know, the LIDAR maps or the MapRika or Google Earth or any of that stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. And and I will say this, too, that the best research you can do sometimes is getting permission to hunt a large parcel of land and just putting your coil to the soil and getting out there and seeing what's out there. Hunt those high points, those ridges, the hunt near the water, find out what was there. You, you just never know until you get out there and start detecting. Sometimes those maps are way off. So if you can get permission on an area or if you have an area that's open to the public, and you can hunt it. Go hunt it. Go see what was there. The best way to do that research, put a coil to the soil. That's right. And another good research tool that we use up here is, of course, our, our cities and towns are so old. You get into these old towns and you find a road that's named Musterfield Hill Road. You find a hole that as a road that's named Swimming Hole Road. I mean, it, that's no brainer right there. You you take those roads, you start doing a little bit of uh, map Rica research or LIDAR maps or anything like that. It's very obvious that something was going on there. And most of the muster fields up where we live for are usually on public land where you don't really need permission, but you can walk into your town hall, look at the tax maps and see if it is public land, if it's conservation land, or even see if it's on somebody's public land that you can easily knock on the door for. So I see Megan has a question in the chat here. She says, uh, uh, when they camped and there was a home, a store and a stagecoach stop within a hundred yards uh, with a well that was that everyone used, uh, where would they stay? That's a great question. Um, again, I would suggest Put the coil to the soil and, and go look for it. Obviously, they're going to stay near that water source. That water source is everything to those soldiers back then. Um, I, I know, I know uh, Megan lives on some property or lives very near some property where there were a heck of a lot of Union soldiers camped at one point. And you never get it all, Megan. You never get it all. So get back in there. Uh, check those spots that you haven't been to before. Check those spots that you have hunted before um, because 
you know, things change, Condition, conditions change, and, and you'd be amazed at what comes out. And change your ground orientation. If you're used to hunting north to south, try it east to west or northeast to southwest or south north, you know, go the opposite directions. You'd be surprised what signals sound differently depending on which orientation that you're actually approaching them from. That's exactly right. I couldn't agree more. And even putting a different machine or a different coil on, try something different, change it up, change a mode, change a setting. It's amazing what it, what a difference it'll make. So did I fix my speak my when I put on the headset? Can you hear me any better? You sound a little bit better. It's not quite as bad. All right. It sounded like you were playing the organ underwater while you were talking. <laughs> After about five brandies. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I can't play the organ. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Megan has a follow-up to your question, Matt. She says, I'm thinking I'm asking if they would camp above the well, like on the hill that rises above the well. That's her thoughts. Yeah, I think, you know, the higher the ground, the better, as long as it hasn't been moved around. A lot of that ground has been scraped around. And, you know, what I run into is, is you know, people move that ground around for whatever reason, building homes. Um, it, it just depends on the area. you got to check the high ground. The higher, the better. I can tell you up here where we live in New England, a lot of the best cellar holes that have produced have been on ridge lines above a river. You know, there's an old Class 6 road. <laughs> There's a stone wall that follows up the ridge line. Some of it was probably pasture land, but then there's usually a cellar hole or a or an outbuilding spot or something like that well away from the well, usually, like you said, higher elevation from the well, but they're always within a good vicinity of some sort of a water thing. That's the only reason I brought that up. Okay, Utah, my time has expired. I, uh, I will yield to the next the person on the uh, panel. Go for it, Swansea. I think, uh, I think I touched along most of it with Matt right there. But yeah, I mean, a lot of what I do for research is a lot of map overlays. I mean, I can take Google Earth and go to MapRika or a, or a system called LIDAR, L-I-D-A-R. There's not a lot of it in a lot of states. Every state has their own individual setup. So it's really tough to know if your state has it because it's not a universal website, but it does have some good information. These are radar images that take out trees, for example. There's no canopy. There's no foliage. It only shows contour in the ground, which I think would work perfect for people that are doing civil, civil war history digging because it will show bunkers. It will show depressions in the ground, but it does not take into consideration vegetation that you normally would get with Google Earth. Hey, Nathan, are you still in here? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Camera, man. I mean, I know you're trying, trying like this to fix it, but I wouldn't worry about it. All right. <clears throat> there, but, There is uh, definitely – oh, go ahead. I'm just going to touch on, on what Swansea was saying. That, um, if I don't get to – to play with very much because there's not any of that. So, um, do you do you find that with cellar hose, your maps were hand drawn in in your library and they don't allow you to take them out or anything? Those off. You're not even allowed to photocopy there? them. Nope. You have to take a picture with your phone and then take that information and put it into a normal local map or something like that. The problem is, is these were hand-drawn maps. They could be off by 50 feet. They could be off by 100 yards. You know, these were done from people's memory and them pacing things off. What I have found out, they're definitely within proximity. Um, if you're going to take that information, take it as loose information, get out there, like Matt said, do the legwork. If you find the cross-section of two stone walls coming together, for example, that's probably the corner of a pasture somewhere in that vicinity, whether it be a quarter mile, it could be three miles at sometimes the way that we do the cellar holes up here. You know, you just never know until you put your feet on the ground, put the coil down to the ground. And Nate was touching on this earlier. He said he's not sure about his iron audio settings. I always have iron audio on because that iron audio will lead you to activity every time. 
Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I've also noticed a few things with the iron audio being on. I like about it is get those mixed signals. You know, you'll hear a little bit of a grunt mixed in there with the high tone. Yeah. The iron audio turned off. A lot of times, all you'll get is the high tone. Oh man, this is awesome. This has got to be silver, and you end up digging it up, and it's can slow or something. Well, that iron audio mm -hmm. makes a difference between digging a hundred nails and not digging a single nail. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so I, I always leave iron audio on unless I'm in just totally overran with iron. I mean, if I'm getting nothing but grunts left and right and it sounds like it's overloading the machine, I'll turn the iron audio off and, and like it that way. And on. Um, but yeah, your machine is a great way to walk you in to where the sites are. Um, like you were saying, or, or activity work at least. Or if you go into an old field, like a oh. pasture or something like that, something that was only used for feeding cattle for, you know, 300 years, you get into a field like that, who knows when there might have been a house site that got bulldozed over or something like that too. If you're not listening to the iron and you're only listening to the mid-tones and relic hunting and cherry picking, I guess is the best way to put it, you're going to miss where that activity may have actually happened in that field. Without hearing the iron, you could be skipping over a huge part of that field, which is what I've normally done. I'm normally a field digger. I've, this is the first year I've done a lot of woods research, but it paid off and tenfold you know just to not skip those iron targets in a field or even in the woods because it brings you closer and closer to activity again my biggest slogan is iron equals activity mm -hmm. definitely yeah especially in in the older sites because almost everything back back in the day so Nathan you were starting to, to comment on there did you have something to add or I I agree with everything that y'all have been saying. Um, I wanted to just kind of clarify that uh, I do I do run with the Iron Audio on on the AT Pro, but what I sometimes get confused about is depending on which uh, setting I've got as to whether it's on or not. But I mean, you can easily tell that it's on when you hear the. <laughs> Because then you know you've got the iron. And, and I do want to throw out there, for anyone that doesn't have audio, um, be a good time to go ahead and upgrade to the AT Pro. So even if you have the Mind Lab like the person we have on here. Um, <laughs> you might want to upgrade to the AT Pro so that you can have that iron audio. Throw that out there at you. Um, oh, it's all good. I actually went detecting with the AT Pro just the other day, so I mean, I still use it. Uh huh. Do it's probably the best machine you got. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Definitely not the most um, expensive I have. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Um. Research tips or. Secrets you want to give out? So, maybe? yeah, what you guys have said, have, you know, has all been real great. Um, I think a lot of it, too, depends, you know, and, and Swansea kind of hit on this, too, um, him being in an older town. But I think a lot of it depends on where you're at geographically. So, Utah, you're out in Texas. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of activity out there until, you know, the middle to later 1800s with the westward expansion and you know the banditos coming up from mexico and this and that and the other and and you know the further you go west the newer things get um and i i feel like the particular area of indiana that i'm in i i kind of have some of that so so like the town that that i live in was first settled like in 1820 or 1821, but it wasn't incorporated, you know, until the 1860s. And there's a lot of history in this town, but it's not a whole lot older, you know, than middle 1800s. And, and so a lot of 
the the type of detecting that that I do is more uh, is more on the newer uh, you know a lot a lot of coin shooting if you will but it you know that's not my intent it's just what I find um, you nailed it, Nathan. I, it depends on where you live you can, you can't expect to find the things that we find in New England in Texas or in Washington State for example you really nailed right. up right. And, and, and when I found my mini ball uh, in a public location in Columbus, Indiana, I, I was truly blown away. And the only thing that I can guess is, you know, there was no Civil War activity uh, nearby. I mean, there was some in Indiana. Uh, I think there was a big battle in Tippy Canoe area. Um, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at all the history for Indiana particularly. But that had to have been dropped by someone after the war. And I know that there were a few families in this town, one family that is still in this town that had relatives that, you know, were in the Civil War and lived through it and actually built this town. Uh, so that's kind of cool. But I never expected to find, you know, that thing – where I did. Uh, so like a lot of the tools that I use, uh, you know, are, are some that have already been mentioned. I do use historic aerials. It, it does, you know, it only goes back to 1956 in my area, but there are some other tools. There are some other aerial maps. I think the farthest aerial map, like actual aerial photography that I can go back is 1937 in my area. That's the oldest aerial I can go back. But there are lots of maps that you can get from the library. Um, and, and there's even some that I could download the, they've scanned into computers and you can go to the library and with your USB device and download it. You've got these old, I can't remember what the maps are called. Um, Sanborn, the, the Sanborn maps. You can get those for my area. Um, Google Maps I use. And and if you're looking at a new town, maybe that you're not a whole lot familiar with, something that I do is I'll actually go to Zillow, which is the, the website for, for real estate. Because in Zillow, you can filter by age of the house. So usually I'll... I'll find my town and I'll plug in the year and it's kind of a hit or miss thing. But if I get like a certain area of town that kind of gives me that older hit, then, Hey, I know that's where I need to kind of start with some of the Google Maps street view. Um, if I'm doing, if I'm looking and that's primarily if I'm looking at doing door knocks, you know, if I'm just looking for coins or whatever on a lazy day, there's other tools that uh, I don't necessarily want to name, but they're, they're good at giving other historical locations. Something that Matt said earlier was the picnic groves. Uh, that, that's something that, that we like to try to research. And I, my, my detecting buddy has probably done more of that than me, and I think that's what he was into before him and I started going together was he used to do a lot of the, the picnic groves and talking to the old timers and figuring out, and, and there's one there, there's a few actually that, that we have within the last year found out about by old timers, but it, it kind of seems like, you know, we have just enough information to kind of have a general idea of where it might be, but we're kind of in that area, that almost gray area now where, well, what can we do to try and figure out, hey, is that really where it's at? Or, you know, is there like another old timer we could talk to? Is there a map? And I think that was something about, you know, going through the genealogy records. That That's, that's a good tip for sure. One thing I figured out was um, about, the topography of different areas and you know like where a stream is at or a river 
and here close to town we have uh, Trinity River that we're, one fork of it runs through here in town but where it's running today close to where it ran 150 years ago 1850 As it is now. We're doing some research. Time as the town grew, they rerouted the river, the fork of the river, different areas to create different floods. Um, but they do that a lot out. I didn't realize this. But they do that a lot out in the fields too, or out in the rural areas. A lot of times, we'll try to get it around their field so that they have perfect square or perfect size and they can reroute that creek around the edge of it. They, well, Mother Nature they do that. And then, yeah, but then over time it'll move gradually and it, it just keeps moving and then of course mankind having its influence on the earth changes it even more. But um guy that was like oh yeah you know on this map there was an old house that used to be about a hundred yards from the river over here well but now that old house is under the river at that particular section you know so you got to be careful with talking to the old timers these landmarks to, to locate things and those landmarks change throughout time they were a kid and five years old it may have been in one area, but it may have moved a hundred or two hundred yards years since then. Um, well, the same thing happens up here with our class city road. Something you know, our to keep in the back of your mind. You have to remember. Exactly, you got to take those maps with a grain of salt. Use it as a reference point. But again, you know, like you said, with the rivers or the waterways or the streams with the farmers, the roads a lot of times change too based on land development. You know, if they went in and logged the place, they may have rerouted that road thirty to forty yards to the right or to the left. You know, they went for the path of least resistance, of course. And if they're going to keep that road accessible, they had to go to the easiest route as possible. So, you know, our class six roads in the 1920s, even for example, are nowhere near the same spots they are nowadays. If you look at the two different maps. It's just, it, it floors me in some cases, like we've actually diverted the topography of places. I mean, it, you don't think about it unless you're this. You don't think about how much it's actually changed. I mean, I'd have never guessed that this river, that this fork of the river used to be a mile and a half from where it is now. I mean, that's it's from where it was. I have found structures on topographical maps before. Yeah, I I got lucky. There was a, a friend of mine that seller hole that he had heard about um, found, but his brother had since passed. He wanted to be able to go out and detect around it, so he gave me the general area and put it on Google Earth. And I was just scrolling along, and I saw on Google Earth what looked like two of the stone walls that were, that used to be there the remnants of them and I was like it looks like something here in the coordinates of where it, that thing was it goes out there and that's where it was so it's always well, another nice thing you can help someone out like that well that and another thing with Google Earth too that people don't realize is you can even go back on their maps to different times of the year I mean like if it's midsummer here you're never going to see stone walls or a or a cellar hole you can go back to say November of last year, you can go back to the winter of the previous year, you can actually go back on Google Earth as well, just to be able to get rid of some of that foliage that might be blocking what you're looking for. Yeah. Like you were saying, I got lucky on this, it was actually a better shot because you could actually see through the trees is what I had foliage on and there's no way I'd have seen that. But 
I know one of the sites I use a lot sometimes for old maps is um, MapWorks. My county here, when I type it in and do a search, maps all the way back from before even it was, the county was even incorporated. A lot of them have been pretty accurate and probably 50 to 100 yards away where they say a house was on this particular section. It shows up when you get out there. I like it a lot better personally simply because I can get the older maps like aerials doesn't doesn't have because there was nothing flying in the air back then to the birds. Trying to also read through some of the chat here to see if there's Yeah, in the historical society, a lot of historical societies are really good, give you a lot of good information. Um, the one thing you have to be careful of, into an area like I'm in, the towns and counties around here that their historical societies ask about history, about anything that happened or where anything was in the historical society for is for political, political you know, promenations of saying, oh, look what I'm a member of. I'm a member of the historical society here. It's something else to add to their resume. So most of them around here are, are not real historical societies, and that's very unfortunate. And I can say the same thing with ours, Utah. I know I know it's a great resource for a lot of people. It all depends on where you live. I know our historical society here is not prone to give out good information on an old town history about where locations were. They'll talk about, you know, if something was first created here or where the old factories were or something like that. You know, that's good local information to have. My take on the historical society is if you're – if you want to give back to your community and you want to give a, a donation to put into one, you can never donate that item. You have to, you have to lend it to them. Cause if they decide to take it off display, it sits in a basement in a box and it's never seen again. If it's lent to the historical society, they have to contact you by law when they take it off of display and then you can put it back in your own personal display. That way it's never really lost again. Exactly. Or so, I mean, there was one one small town here that down their historical society they actually sold all the relics and stuff they had. And if it's a donated eBay'd item, they have the right to sell it. Yeah, they literally eBayed everything, and it just I was like, oh man, yeah, <laughs> I couldn't believe that they did that, but. Yeah. Um. It's kind of funny though how you have the you have the different people that you know don't want to have anything to do with museums or historical societies and then you have the the people that do and it's kind of like just two separate uh, thought patterns. Yeah, it's mind blowing to be honest with you, Nathan. It doesn't make any sense why you know one state's historical societies are about preserving the history for their community, and then the next one's all about—I hate to say it—but profit. And uh, like Utah was saying, it's it's all about status, right? And and it 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 sometimes yeah. can make you a little—I don't know. For me, it, it personally it. it it would make me wary of if, if that's all my state cared about was, you know, the profit and this and that and the, the their glory that they get from, you know, displaying such and such thing. It, it makes me not want to participate. Well, participate, but loan. Again, do not donate. Just loan it. They have to give it back to you. Right, right. Yeah. I learned I mean, the hard way. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say... I just want to chime in here, guys, real quick. I think okay. I, I totally agree with what you guys are saying with the historical society. It, it really varies from location to location. 
what yeah. you need to do is hitch your wagon to the appropriate um, historical group in your area. It might be the historical society. It might be a local college or high school historian. It might be someone at the state level who is interested in, in working with you in, in recovering the relics. You, you, you have to be careful about who you're working with. Right. Well said, Matt. Now, yeah. Um, I think one one potential advantage. There are, I was going to say there are places there are places like the CWPPO up in Ohio, societies that Sam works with. I mean, they they really want to preserve the history. They really want to find out exactly what happened. Those are the kind that, that I love. Give me hope for humanity. They're doing what they're supposed to. Agreed 100%. So like, those are the people you want to hit your wagon to. Oh, yeah, definitely. Exactly. <clears throat> and I was just going to say for myself, you know, the, the town I live in, I actually kind of by accident um, met the guy who does all of the historical research of his own. Um there's a there's a local website for Columbus, Indiana that is just end to end history, and that is that is actually where I've gotten a lot of my information from is that website. But it was all done by one guy who you know he grew up in this town, he lived in this town until he was you know old enough to get out on his own, went out on his own, and just felt a deep burning down inside of him to come back home where he belonged and dedicate his life to basically documenting the history of this town. And this guy is really cool. But like, if you wanted to check out the site, it's uh, historic Columbus, Indiana, it's either .com or .org. But if you just type historic Columbus, Indiana into Google, you can find it out. And I mean, it's just crazy. The amount of, of, hours that this guy has put in to building this website doing all of the research on all of the families you know like i said dating back to the 1860s where the, some of the the people who built this town were actually in the civil war uh and you know meeting him was was incredible because not only does does he have a deep passion for history itself, but also preserving history? And he works very closely with the, the local historical society here in my area. And, and he would be the person that I would hitch my wagon to because I know that, uh, you know, by following him, uh, I wouldn't get burned. I, it's just he's got character that you don't find in a lot of people. Like somebody like that, you know, uh, you know their hearts in it for the right reasons. Right. I grew up in here. Have time they had a historical society, political reasons. Um, they said that they would. You know, I went by the town hall and was talking to them. They said that they were thinking about starting up another historical society and this time actually having display items and different maps of back in back in the late 1800s and such. Sounds good. But in the back of my mind, I remember the old historical society that the only thing that they did it for was like I said, to have another line on their resume or dominance to have on there. To act like they gave it down. And and you know, for my area, Utah, I, I don't think that there was anything documented the way that it is today before this guy started doing that website. You know, they've they've got 
stuff at the library and, you know, all the, the books and stuff, but to have something as easily available for just anyone, none of that existed until this guy did what he did. And he did closely work with the historical society on it. And I, yeah, I, I think I, I want to like you, you got a good, you follow there. I do. The only problem is there's <laughs> there's not really a whole lot of old stuff left. You know, this town it was it was incorporated in like 1864, 1865, something like that. But a lot of the original town has been plowed over and rebuilt upon you know in the 20s and 30s and so what you what what downtown used to be, you know, 1860s and now a lot is you know 1930s and a lot of the houses are 1930s to 50s and what used to be 1860s areas and a lot yeah. of dirt's been pushed My, around and grew up in they had a war two prisoner camp there camp that they ended up putting the little league ball fields out out by where that was at and the simps tore down absolutely everything that was there. Water tower, prisoner of war camp. Uh, they've demolished all that. They put in so many fields out there that they've covered up all, and redone all the ground with it. They're planning on finishing it off by putting in three more fields and a road going through it. I mean, they've just totally destroyed some of the town's history. The only thing they're going to have left is a plaque. That just makes me sick to see them do that. But that they call progress. Oh, it's actually kind of funny. There's there's a group in in my town um, that actually kind of seems more pro progress and less. Uh, history it's it's actually a group dedicated to um they they call themselves oh shoot columbus is not a museum is the name of their group and and they're pretty much like a, a history hate group you know they're they're all those artsy fartsy hipster idiots that i can't stand about 99.9% .9 of the time, and they're all about, you know, destroy or not preserving uh, what built the town. You know, it, it it's not just a bunch of old junk and old, old buildings that are falling apart. It's what built the town. Exactly. Maybe that's just my rant for the evening. Um, it's uh, going over an hour and a half now, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Can I add before we call it the night? I would definitely like to come back sometime. Awesome. We'd, be, we'd be happy I'm, to I'm have probably going to have to. I know. Uh, I'm definitely going to have to figure out my my uh, technology issue. Um, it, it's kind of funny. I work on computers um, all day, every day at work, but I can't seem to figure out why my webcam won't work. Ah, like I said, the webcam's no big deal. As long as we get the... what it's about. Coming on, man. It's been an honor having you. Uh, it'll be an honor to have you back sometime. Um, Heck yeah. Next month, we do have that's tentatively lined up, but I'm not going to put that out until it's 100% because I don't want to I don't want to tie them down just yet. Next next month is going to be an incredible episode again. Um, I don't know yet what the topic's going to be, and on our Facebook group, go ahead and. Going over there, um, it's detecting American history, and uh, that's usually where and uh, topic 
for the month of that. Um, other than that, uh, Matt, Swansea, Tim, Sandy, thank you all for coming on yet again. For having no you guys on the panel with me. Um, I know uh, there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on in the digging community since it's the the downtime season for a lot of people. So a lot of people are digging and searching and that they've already found. So uh, I, I, I presume there's going to be a lot coming out in the next month or two to talk about. Anyway, until next time, y'all. See y'all soon.